I think one of the points that you made was that the reason why the white proletariat or the white working class was not really um, as active in the civil rights movement and black liberation movements um, was because they were still riding high from the uh, the fact that World War II was over the United States was economically uh, the I mean it was at the top you know they were they were uh, benefiting from this uh, system from the sort of racial capitalism um, and they didn't feel like it made sense for them to put their bodies on the line for for people of color for black folks for indigenous folks uh, because they didn't they feel like that was the point you know what are we going to get out of it of course um, but it seems that we're in a very different place now um, white folks are are in a different position economically so if we could speak more to how class is being highlighted more than ever right now and how that's creating uh, solidarity among people across racial lines um, and whether or not that recognition that, say, white folks are coming to, um, and not all, of course, but certain segments of the white population are coming to, um, that that can somehow like break the spell of whiteness to a certain degree. Does that make any sense? Do you sense that I guess the class conflicts that we're seeing right now is going to actually create lasting solidarity among peoples across racial lines? Do either of you get that sense? Can we ask uh, Arturo first about that? Uh, I mean, it, it's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we should be thinking about that um, and trying to see where that's happening and where it's failing to happen or where it's being, you know, stopped from happening. And, um, but it, it, yeah, it's, I mean, I don't think it's a, it's like a, it's a reality that is the dominant reality in any kind of way. Um, and I mean, you know, it, it, that's kind of the way that Noel Ignatiev framed it. Um, in terms of what is the role of white people and in, if white people become part of this revolutionary proletarian struggle, then they will uh, help undo whiteness and provoke a, a revolution, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, for me, I mean, I think it's, it's I, the, the way that I, I'm trying to think about what's happening is is not necessarily in, in, along the lines of separate uh, racial groups that are like coming into this situation from separate angles, but just what what has happened on the ground, where it's not you know one you you can say that white proletarians are doing this or the the black people there are doing that and or the Puerto Rican people are doing this other thing, and it, it's all it's all just like jumbled together on the ground the way that people are acting. And fighting against the state and um everybody you know as, as with as many people as possible we should we should be fighting the state and we, we see some white people doing that so we need to make sense of that and, and develop of uh, that as part of our revolutionary strategy for the united right. states um right. so these this document and this text and the, i feel like the things we're writing are, are just like very much in the moment and trying to make sense of what's happening with these experiences and these things that we're seeing. Um, and it, it's not so much about uh, what is the role of white people or, you know, white working class people. Um, and, um, and so I think that's part of our critique also in the piece of Noel, even though we, I, I think we agree with him in a lot of ways um, there is no coherent kind of like white proletariat that we can talk about or even black proletariat um, or, you know, all kinds of groups that we, there, there's something that's going on now that is uh, different from the past, which, which is the way that it always is. And right. um, we need to, you know, make sense of this period that we're, we're in, which I, you know, I think it's safe to say is going to become a revolutionary period in our right. history. Uh, Shimon, did you have anything to say to that? Yeah, I mean, I think 
you know, my sense of the piece is that we don't know if the split among whites, which I think is really important in analyzing when great instability happens. You know, right, there's like a tweet. I forget who tweeted it. It said, wow, this is an ama- This is a crazy moment in U.S. history. White people are killing other white people over like whether Black Lives Matter or not, right? And that's like pretty unique um, in U.S. It only happens, you know, it, we, arguably it's only happened like two other times, like maybe the 60s with, with the weather underground and some of that kind of stuff. And then, of course, the Civil War. Which is only to which is to kind of remind us that these splits among whites is not is not a guaranteed permanence, right? So the 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 after the defeat of Reconstruction, Jim Crow and the defeat of the populist movement kind of re-cements whiteness. After the defeat of the civil rights movement, a certain kind of neoliberalism, fear of crime, um, right, kind of holds down whiteness. And then 9-11, I think, kind of plays another role in securing whiteness for a certain amount of time. And so we shouldn't assume the, 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 the cleverness of the movement has to be, can it keep whites divided, right? And not mm-hmm. allow mm-hmm. them to reform back into, right? The, the, what white people are supposed to do in America is love the boss, right? So speaking of class, but inseparable from race, love police, love private property, and love the country, i.e. nationalism and jingoism and, and chauvinism and that kind of stuff, right? And so the movement needs to figure out how to keep white people split because there it does, and I want to say it seems, right? Artur and I, like, it's not like we've looked at tons of data. The, this is a moving event, a brand new event in many ways. So we're looking at who we're seeing in the street, report backs, news story accounts, looking at who's gotten arrested. And it seems to point that there's been a split. And that split, to speak of the split among whites, it is it is on class terms because it's not like really rich whites who are fighting. Um, it seems to be younger whites, Gen Z, and millennial whites, uh, right? Those two. So basically under 40 is the, uh, we would say, and, and the reality is that the, the riots and the rebellion have been much younger. I mean, 19, 20, 21, 22. Uh, so Gen Z age group of whites, which are the generation now of the millennials had no future, the Gen Z kids are even more fucked, right? Um, so there's, that's how you <laughs> yeah. see the class manifesting itself. And then the last thing I'll say is just to think about how whiteness has been split, right? We it, It's the decisive split, I think we would say, has been caused by the uprising, right? The uprising gave voice to basically the entire prehistory of grievances that I think lots of white people had, which was the pandemic, right? It was Trump. It was the bullshit Trump had put the country through. And then stepping back a little more, it was neoliberalism, right? So you saw in cities like Atlanta and New York and Chicago, the looting took place. And right, there's a new geography of looting. The looting did not happen in the hood in many big cities. It happened in the richest parts of the big cities, the shopping districts that have become right little like uh, islands of joy for the very rich um, that's where the, the riots went and looted on average. Now, yes, there's also other things that were looted, right, that don't reflect wealth, uh, extreme wealth. But on average, I think the it is true. Um, it was generally the major shopping areas that were looted. So you see all right. those things connecting to each other in that manner. Mm-hmm. 